Shad Adversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm here at the World Jousting Championship, which is being held in Lardner Park, Victoria, Australia. A truly phenomenal event for any medieval enthusiast, where the grand medieval tradition of jousting is being preserved and presented for anyone who would like to come and be immersed in this awesome historical period. The jousting that we see here in the World Jousting Championship is very accurate to the type of competitive jousting that existed in the past, but what point in the past existed? Exactly, because, of course, the medieval period stretched a very long period of time. So when was this type of jousting more practiced in the past? And are there any differences between the jousting of the medieval period and the type that we see here? Even though the jousting that we do see recreated the World Jousting Championship is actually very accurate. From the armor to the horsemanship and lances themselves, this is actually very close to what you would have seen in medieval times. But there are some unique and specific specific differences. In the 11th, 12th and even 13th century, the medieval tournament didn't actually look like what we see here in regards to the traditional joust. A far more common type of tournament during these periods was a more open melee, where many knights who wished to compete would join in the tournament and a location would be designated. This might have been a village or even just the local area around a village. And the knights would have at it, not trying to kill each other, but trying to subdue each other, capture them, capture their horses or just simply beat an opponent into submission and there were many deaths that occurred in this early type of tournament. Now, was every single medieval tournament of these periods structured in this format? No. There would have been many regional differences. And these tournaments were held as an opportunity for the knights who were participating in it to win prestige and also display their martial prowess. And those two points are the more significant things to consider. It was far less a sport than it was a chance to display martial prowess and because of that we actually don't see a codified set of rules that was agreed upon for every single tournament held. It's far more likely that whoever was running the tournament would set their own rules as they saw fit. And this also applies to when the medieval tournament started to move away from the open melee to the more formal joust. And it started with open field jousting with no tilt line separating the two knights as they rode towards one another, which is far more dangerous and actually has a chance that the horses themselves would actually clash and hit each other. Or they might rear up to prevent that collision, throwing their riders off. The tilt line that separates the two riders as they charge towards one another is a very significant, important and safe addition to this idea of the medieval joust. In the World Jousting Championship, it is is actually structured more along the lines of a more traditional sport as we would be more familiar with in the modern day. One point for a broken lance that breaks at the top, two points for a break of the lance that's in the meat of the lance, the thicker part, and three points to an unhorsing or a coronal break. A coronal is the metal fitting that's placed on the tip of the lance to make them more safe, but there's also other significant reasons for the coronal, which I'll go into a bit later in the video. And then with these points in mind, there are three passes to a match. A pass is when two knights charge towards one another. And then of course, the knight with the most points wins. But it wasn't as structured as this in the medieval period. That's not to say that there wasn't structures within the tournaments themselves. I'm just saying that there wasn't a unified rule set that existed for every Every single tournament in every region and time of the medieval period. Even though this seems quite obvious and evident, it is important to point out that the medieval joust is reflecting medieval warfare, knightly mounted medieval warfare. And there's some really interesting things that I want to share with you about the combative side of the mounted knight. The medieval historian Michael S. Curl has recently published a new thesis in the Journal of the Royal Armory's Arms and Armor entitled Late Medieval Lance Use. Mounted Combat and Martial Arts in Western Europe from the 14th to 16th century. It's a mouthful, but it's a very up-to-date, detailed study on the martial side of lance use in medieval combat. And there is some great information in this article. For instance, Michael is able to share with us that the distinction between a lance and a spear is a more modern notion that actually came about during the 16th century. Before the 14th century, the words lance and spear were actually synonymous. And this, of course, makes sense because the first 
quote-unquote lance that was used by a knight on horseback was just a spear. And in actual fact, even when you look at the more traditional kind of lance that we would identify as a lance distinct being different from a spear, meaning a couched lance, this type of lance that was actually used in warfare was far more spear-like than the ones that we see in jousting tournaments. For instance, lances used for traditional jousting has a round conical metal plate to deflect incoming lance strikes, but the article on late medieval lance use actually states that these van plates were not actually commonly used during war. Now this makes absolute sense because in an actual battle scenario, once you use your lance and you're able to actually skewer your opponent, but even if you miss and it breaks or something, more often than not the lance needs to be dropped, especially if you've actually been able to skewer an opponent. You're not going to be able to pull it out, the lance needs to be abandoned. And if you are making a metal protector for every single lance that a knight would go through in a single battle, that is a huge amount of wasted resources. Whereas in a tournament, you know your opponent is also using a lance, and so there's a chance that the opponent's lance actually might strike your hand, so you want something to protect it. And the van plate can simply be retrieved from the broken lance after every use and put on a new one. In the medieval tournament, there were two types of jousts. There was a joust of war and a joust of peace. The joust of war was nearly a direct simulation of actual medieval battle, except of course with a tilting line except the very very early jousts to separate the horses. The Joust of War was conducted with real war lances, though you would probably see a van plate on them, but they were tipped lances and made of solid ash or beech, a harder type of wood. The Joust of Peace is the type of joust that is recreated in the World Jousting Championship, where the lances are made from a lighter type of wood, usually pine, much safer, they will break easier, though it still takes a significant force to break them, and they are tipped with that coronel. The coronel is not a spearhead, in fact it's a multi pronged metal head that's made to disperse the force on impact, but also so the lance tip catches on the opponent's shield or armor and doesn't deflect off. When the tip of the lance gets caught in this instance, the lance will break, and that is the whole goal of the Joust of Peace, to break the lance without injuring your opponent. And of course, it looks spectacular when the lance just explodes into several pieces. The coronel is specifically made to facilitate this. Now, does this mean that every single lance used for the battlefield and the Joust of War were made out of harder, heavier types of wood? Not in every instance. Of course, there would have been lances made out of lighter timbers as well. It's very common to have exceptions to a standard practice in this instance. Looking at the medieval joust, one might assume that lances were always exceptionally long, and this would be an incorrect notion. Many kinds of lances were used in Western Europe during the late Middle Ages, although each lance varied in weight and length. By about the 15th century, there were two broad types of war lance. Or at the very least, these lances can be grouped into two loose categories. Did these categories exist in the medieval period? Most likely not, and there wouldn't have been distinct categories. But Michael in his article identified identifies the larger lances as full lances and the smaller ones as demi lances. There has been a huge amount of emphasis, research and study put into the couched full lance. And though of course this technique was used historically and was truly devastating, it's incorrect to think that this was the only technique used by mounted knights. Michael Curl within his article actually shares historical references that shows the lance being used in different ways other than the couch charge. And this of course makes absolute sense because there are many situations in the medieval battlefield in which the couch position would not be as effective. For instance, what if the charge was stalled and the knight gets in much closer range to an opponent? If you're holding the lance with one hand in a couch position, especially if it's a full lance with such length on it, this would actually become a very awkward and cumbersome weapon. But there were shorter lances that of course could have been used in a charge just as effectively. There range would have been limited, but their versatility would have been much higher, and even with the larger lances, there are techniques that can be used outside of the couched position where they can be effective even in closer range. One of the techniques that Michael points out is using the lance in two hands. Using the lance like this in close range, but also holding the lance in two hands for a mounted charge as well. Heck, there are even references of the butt of the lance being used to bludgeon an opponent. This is kind of like the Mordhaus strike, but for a lance. Simply put, 
lance-mounted combat of the medieval period was a far more diverse and versatile thing than many people suppose when they think of the mounted knight. If you would like to learn more about this, you can purchase Michael's article through the link in the description below, where he goes into great detail revealing some of the more obscure ways lances were used that many people are not even aware of. Drawing his information from direct historical references, this is Hema, historical European martial arts, but in an area that many people haven't given a lot of attention. Mounted combat, lance use. One of the more significant and crucial elements of the mounted charge in both combat and jousting is actually the saddle, specifically the high-backed saddle. The impact of these lances when they strike, both in jousting and in combat, they can have a heck of a kick. And the high-backed saddle helps keep the rider in place, where they have something to brace against when they are knocked back. It's an incorrect notion to think that it is the stirrup that enables mounted combat in this way. The stirrup assists and helps, and I've even spoken to the jousters, and some have even mentioned to me that they use the stirrup to stand up in the saddle when they strike with their lance, but I've also read articles by other jousters who have experimented with actual jousting done without stirrups and even without a saddle, and they were able to reproduce it in a very effective manner. The stirrup is not required for an effective mounted charge with a lance. And even the saddle is not fully required, although it helps in a much more significant way, far more than the stirrup. You will have probably noticed the distinct and stylized shield worn by the knights when they joust. It needs to be understood that these shields are not made for combat. The armor technology that was developed in the 14th and 15th century basically made the shield mostly redundant. They simply weren't needed, especially by knights wearing full plate armor. So then why are these knights wearing shields and why are they designed the way they are? Again, it's for the goal of jousting they are trying to break their lance on their opponent. The shield is actually designed to help facilitate this. The strong curve it has is made to catch the lance. And if the lance gets caught on something, instead of being deflected off, it will break. And then combine that with the coronal on the tips of the lances being specifically made to catch on the shield and also parts of the armor, but they work in conjunction with the shield in a very effective way. This type of shield now actually functions as the target in jousting, and this is very contrary to the battlefield where you would not be aiming for the shield at all. In actual fact, you would be trying to aim for the vulnerable areas on the opponent, not the most protected areas. Training to strike the jousting shield wouldn't be detrimental to your prowess in combat, but you still need to train accuracy in your charge to hit that shield. And the greater accuracy the knight would be able to develop in guiding their lance means they'll be able to guide it to the open areas far more effectively in real combat. So jousting isn't identical to medieval mounted combat, but it's a direct manifestation from that martial tradition, and the type of jousting we see at the World Jousting Championship is very, very accurate to the medieval jousting that was done historically. There are some additional elements that of course existed, like as I mentioned the Joust of War, which was done with actual pointed lances, which of course we can't recreate in the modern day, it's just way too dangerous, and the regional preferences and variances that would have existed between many different tournaments. Yet still, it is just phenomenal to see this tradition being carried on. It's a window into our past, a catalyst for looking further into this idea of mounted combat, lance warfare, and of course, it's exciting and a wonder to behold in real life. So a big thank you to Michael S. Curl for sharing his research and article with me. Thank you to Andrew McKinnon and Rebecca Wake for helping me out at the World Jousting Championship and also setting it up. Thank you for watching and a very big thank you to all those fans who came up and said hi to me at the Jousting Championship. It was awesome to meet you in real life and made me even more excited for the Shadowversity meet and greet at the Abbey Medieval Festival coming up. I hope to see you there if you can make it and until that time, farewell.